started out just as any other night, except for that angel. I ain't seen nothing like it before or since. Us shepherds, we don't get a lot of excitement out there in the pasture. But that angel came right up to us, so bright, so beautiful. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Samantha, you've been out in that pasture just a little too long. I had the same exact thought. Till that angel started talking to me. Don't be afraid, the angel said. Well, I shouted right back at him, too late! <laughs> then that angel said, wait a minute, I want to get this part just right. I wrote it down. Eggs, milk, bread. Oh, wait a minute, that's my grocery list. Here, I've got it right here on this other side. I have good news of great joy that shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And then said, he'll be laying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. Now go find him. Okie dokie. Well, then one of the other sh shepherds, they got so excited. They said, what are we waiting around here for? Let's get out there and get to Bethlehem. So we hightailed out of there and found that beautiful little baby. Now, I'm a different shepherd after that night because God chose me. And in my life, no one's ever chose me. I'll never forget what that angel said. Good news to all people. And that meant me too. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all, all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel multitudes of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom his favor rests. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. I wonder what it means that God would send his son to be born in a manger and that the news would come from angels to shepherds. Because shepherds weren't really very popular. And shepherds weren't powerful. Shepherds were the least of these. Shepherds were the last. Shepherds weren't very religious. At least they didn't get to attend synagogue and they probably lacked the education that most people that went to synagogue had. So why a manger? Why a stable? Why Bethlehem? And why shepherds and angels? And why does the best news in the entire universe, the best news of all time, come to people out in a field who were the least of these first? I wonder what God is doing when he does that. The writer of the Gospel of John says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When Jesus came into that stable that day, that was God speaking to us in, his, in the Word. The literal Logos, the, the one that would translate who God was to the world, is born in a place, in a manger, in a humble and lowly place with the best news of all time, 
the greatest cosmic news of all time given to the lowliest people in the most unlikely way. What's going on when God does that? Why does God do it that way? What's happening? I think it's true. What scripture says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. That when we humble ourselves before him, that will be that he'll be found by us, that he will meet us where we are. But I think it's also true. The bigger the palace, the harder it is to hear from God. Because in that region where the shepherds were not far away, there was a tremendous fortress palace called Herodium. And Herodium was this amazing fortress palace that was built by King Herod. And it was less than four miles from Bethlehem. On a clear day, you can see Herodium from Bethlehem. It was a site where Herod had had, had a military battle 30 or so years before the birth of Christ. And he had won on that high, high part of the plain there. And then to commemorate his victory in battle, Herod built a larger mound. It almost looks like a volcano looking from Bethlehem toward Herodium. And on top of that giant mound that looks like a volcano, he built a fortress palace. And it was amazing. It was crazy, crazy big. It was about seven stories high at the highest point. It's already up, up on a hill you could see from Bethlehem. But on top of that hill, he builds this fortress palace out of, out of stone. And then against the stone walls, he stacks up even more dirt. And then there's, there's the entrance. You come up around the side of the hill and you have to come up a ramp and around past big towers and turrets before you can come into the, into the fortress city. And inside this fortress city palace thing he has built, there are reservoirs for water in a land that's mostly arid and dry. And there's abundant water stored there and there's extra provisions and there's lots of rooms and there's opulence and it's incredible wealth that would dwarf anything we could imagine today. I tried to figure out, is there a government building in the United States that I believe would equal Herodium? And I just simply can't come up with it. I can't figure out if we have anything built in the United States that would equal the grandeur and the magnificence of Herodium, of this palace that this king built for himself just a few miles from Bethlehem. What does it mean that the news came to shepherds before it came to Herod? What does it mean that God would allow shepherds in a field who were nobodies to hear the news first? I think it means that God gives grace to the humble and he resists the proud, that the bigger the palace, the harder it is to hear from God. The more powerful we are, the harder it is to hear. The more puffed up we are with pride and arrogance in our own selves, the tougher it is for Christmas to come. If you're having trouble with Christmas this season and you're trying to figure out why the message of Christmas just isn't as fresh as it used to be, the place to start is in the heart. The place to look is within and to see and to ask yourself, I wonder what kind of palace I've built up for myself. I wonder what kind of pride has crept into my life and is keeping me from this great news that used to mean so much, but now it's kind of grown dim. Because you can be really close to where Jesus was born and still miss the whole thing. Herodium would have been well known in that entire region. And that was only one of Herod's building projects. Herod was an amazing architect. He built all kinds of things. And he was skilled in the art and use of power. He was a puppet dictator king. He was owned by the Romans who occupied that territory. He was not a Jew, and yet he ruled over the Jews. He was from the, from the clashing tribe of Edom. And if you know much about the Old Testament, you'll know that they were not friends with the Israelites. And, and yet this fellow was in charge of that region and in charge of those Jews in that place. So he was feared and reviled and um, hated, despised. I can't use enough adjectives for probably how people felt about him. And yet he was amazingly powerful. And Herod, this Herod, spanned the birth of Jesus 
till just after the birth of Jesus, four or five years after the birth of Jesus. And then there were other Herods, his sons, that would rise to power. So all through the span of the time of Christ, as you read the New Testament, you'll see Herods appearing. Not the same one as this one, Herod the Great, but her other Herods that would rise up. But the presence of Herod reminded me a little bit of the presence of, now be care, I'll be careful with this, of the Kennedys here in the United States. Like this is re these are really powerful people. These are people that know how to rise to power. These are people that know how to maintain power and how to transfer power and how to, and how to rule and how to be sure that they've got the best place at the seat and the, the, the best place at the table, the best seat at the table, and that, they, and that they are constantly in the limelight. They're really, really good at playing the political games of power and of pride and of place. They're, they're spectacular at it. Matter of fact, they could probably have written some books or given some seminars on how to be the best, how to be the wisest, how to be the, be the biggest leader in the whole region. They could probably do those sorts of things. And yet it's interesting that the angels didn't show up at Herodium. The angels showed up to shepherds in a field tending their flocks. Because God gives grace to the humble. And he resists the proud. So let's look at the story of Herod. It's another familiar passage. It's in Matthew 2. And I'll take you into this scripture for just a moment. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea and the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Now, what's the problem with what they just asked him? The king of the Jews. Who were they talking to? The king of the Jews, right? Herod assumed himself to be king of the Jews, and yet these wise men and 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 it's interesting, as I thought about this, how could you get access to the king? You can only get access to the king if you have some sort of powerful position yourself. So when these wise men appeared, they probably appeared with quite an entourage and quite a bit of power and prestige and pomp and circumstance that allowed them to be ushered into the presence of the king, the presumed king of the Jews, and they asked him an interesting question. <laughs> Where is he? who has been born king of the Jews. And I'm sure he wanted to say, well, you're looking at him. I'm here. I'm right here. For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. <laughs> and if you had been under the rain and in the shadow of Herodium and his other building projects, as impressive as those were, you would have been terrified. Because when Herod is troubled, the whole kingdom is in trouble. This is an evil king. For as much as he was fantastic, his, his, his willingness and ability to rise to power and to assume power, he was equally tyrannical. And if you crossed his paths, he, didn't, he would not bat an eye to have you killed. He had his beautiful princess bride killed. Eventually, he killed his own sons because he was threatened by them. This is a murderous, tyrant, dictator, king. So when he's troubled, everybody's troubled. This is not good news. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going to, into the house, they saw the child w with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. See, Herod keeps showing up in this story. Herod's present in the, in the same place, in the same region that the shepherds were in the field with their flocks. And they were near Bethlehem, which was the birthplace for the lambs that would be, that would be sacrificed later as sacrificial lambs for the sins of their people. It was Herodium and Herod and Jerusalem and Bethlehem and this whole region dominated by the presence of this Herod the Great, who I, well, I might also call Herod the Terrible. Now when they departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I will call my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and all the region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they care no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in the dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child, his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. By the way, when Herod died, he arranged for many dignitaries in that region, many people that were well-loved to be killed at the same time of his death to be sure that people would actually mourn when he died. That's how brutal this guy was. This is how vicious he was. This is how power hungry he was. This is how over the top he was. For as skilled and magnificent as buildings were, his ruthlessness equaled its height and stature. It was amazing how ruthless he was and how skilled he was at building both. It was, he was crazy good and crazy bad all, all at the same time. All wrapped up under the same person. It's interesting to me that Herod gets the news about the birth of Jesus through the wise men who come from far away. It's kind of like you hear about the Christmas party that your neighbor's having because you run into another friend at the grocery store a few days later and find out you weren't invited. Not that it's ever happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> Just say it. Um, maybe it's happened to you. I don't know. But, but Herod didn't get an invitation. This Christmas party, he didn't get invited to. The down and out, the least of these, got invited to the first Christmas party, the great birth of the king of the universe. And the king of that region gets left out. So what's going on in this story? What is God saying to you and to me about Christmas and about how it comes and about how Christ comes and who he comes to? What does the message mean? God resists the proud. Gives grace to the humble. That he comes to those who will humble themselves. 1 Peter 5 says that we should clothe ourselves with humility. That we should, that we should wrap ourselves up in humility. And we should let others be better than ourselves. We're instructed elsewhere to take the last seat at the table of honor and not the first. To go to the back of the line and don't just assume you've got the first place in the line. Because Jesus said, he said, the last are going to be first and the first are going to be last. And all throughout Jesus' ministry and career, you can see him choosing the weak and the last and the cast out and the cast off and the outsiders to make them insiders. While at the same time, he opposes the insiders. He opposes the religious insiders. He opposes the wealthy insiders. Insiders, the too proud for God insiders, the ones whose palace is too big to let God in, even though it's close to Bethlehem. It's interesting that both sets of people, both Herod and the shepherds, get the same news. There's a king that's been born. They got it through different avenues. There's a king that's been born. They get the same call to worship. And yet they have totally 
opposite reactions. And today I want to tell you, you and I have the same call to worship. We have the same call to come by way of the manger, to come to a humble place where the king of the universe was born, and to remember that God uses foolish things to confound the proud. That God used a manger and a cross to remind us that he gets his work done in ways that we wouldn't. That it's not by power or might that God's work gets done. But it's by the Spirit of the Lord. And that God can do his work any way he wants to, anywhere he wants to, however he wants to, through whoever he chooses to use. And he can send the news to whoever he wants to. My hope for you today is this. It's simple. That you would be humble enough that you would clothe yourself with humility, that you would come out from behind your fortress palace that you've built where you're safe and secure from everything, where you don't have to be bothered by the world's mud and mess, that you would come out from behind all of your pretense and your proudness, and you would make your way to the manger, and you would worship Jesus. That you would understand that God is close to the brokenhearted. He's close to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. But he resists the proud. That's my hope for you this Christmas. That in the days ahead, the few days between now and Christmas, that you would search your heart and see what stands between you and God what stands between you and this good news. To look in your heart and see if the spirit of Herod lurks there. The spirit of Herod seeks to kill this good news. The spirit of Herod is in opposition to the news that it's the humble that God uses. And it's not fortresses and palaces that Jesus came to establish, but it was a movement that would move through the hearts of people that would humble themselves under the hand of God. So my hope is that you would choose true worship this Christmas over power and pride. That you would do what it takes to humble yourself in the sight of God. I don't know what that means for you. I don't know if this Christmas that means that, that you take an extra trip to a soup kitchen somewhere and you go be reminded there's just the grace of God that stands between you and that. That you're fortunate and that all that you believe may have been created by your own hands is truly a gift from God. That everything we have came from Him and it all goes back to Him. That we are His people. We didn't make ourselves So if you're blessed, I'm glad for you. And if this has been a hard year, I'm glad for you. Because for those who are brokenhearted, it's easier to hear this good news. It's easier for the angels to come and to speak to you. You get it. You know you need good news. It's tougher. It's tougher sometimes when everything's been great, when we've been able to build our own palace and make it taller and bigger than ever. Tougher to hear the news. Tougher to let it come into our hearts. Tougher to let it penetrate the shell of our fortress. But my hope is this will, that you will, this year, somehow humble yourself. Come back to the throne of grace. Come back to a cradle. Come back to a manger and be reminded that God loves you. And that the news the angels sent that night is for you too even if you're the least of these. And even if you're the proudest person in the room with the most accomplishments and the biggest fortress, this news is for you too. But you have a choice. Will you leave your fortress 
Will you come to a manger? Will you kneel there? Will you come before that king? Will you humble yourself before him and say, Man, I am yours, Jesus, and I want to be yours more than I want to be anything else. Romans 14, 10 through 12 tells us this. For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. See, every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. You can do it now, or you can do it later. But you will do it. You can choose now to humble yourselves in the presence of Christ, the King of the universe, born in a stable. Or you can resist and be proud and go your own way. And this news can bounce off of the shell of your fortress today, and you can leave here and miss Christmas. Or you can humble your heart. And this great news can penetrate that fortress and transform it into a place of worship. That's my hope for you. So which path will you choose this Christmas? Which way will you go? The way of the shepherd or the way of the king?